speaker is uh, Joao Freitas, uh, who is the CTO at The Fine Crowd, uh, and he's going to be talking on how AI is disrupting the world. So please give a round of applause to Joao. Hi everyone, my name is Joao, and I'm the CTO of Define Crowd. How many of you have had this issue with personal assistants like Siri, Google Now, or Alexa? Please raise your hands. Okay, I see a few. And why does that happen? Why doesn't it recognize your Portuguese or French or accent? Why doesn't it recognize? Well, probably because it lacks data, because it was trained it wasn't trained with your accents, or it doesn't understand your intent. So that's what we do at Define Crowd. We help these systems be better. But before I go into the, what Define Crowd does, I want to briefly explain how AI has evolved and why is this important. Okay? So this is the first vocoder. So a bit different from what we saw in Alexa, isn't it? And this was 1939. So in 1939, uh, we already had a TTS, but it was a TTS that was mechanical, that was trying to mimic the, the, how the humans behave. And if we look at text, in the 60s, we got our first chatbot. Was it a complex chatbot based on deep learning? No, it was a chatbot based on regular expressions something that is nowadays common for a developer to use. And it was used in 66 in order to build Eliza, the first, the first chatbot. And if you look at the words in bold, you'll see that Eliza is basically a set of rules, taking advantage of certain parts of the sentence that the rules determine to be important. And then it mixes them together, and it makes it look like a dialogue. But if you interact with Eliza for a couple of minutes, it doesn't look natural. It just doesn't feel like if it's someone on the other side. And that's what we want to achieve. We want to achieve AI and intera human-computer interaction in, an, in a natural manner. So welcome to the AI revolution. We now have AI in automotive. Uh, we are having automatic cars where I can put my feet on the tablet and the car will take me to the place I want. But for that, I need to interact with the car. I need to say I want to activate my automatic driving. I, I need, the car needs to respond to me. All that should be done in a natural manner. And how many of you believe that AI can create art? Please raise your hand. Okay. So I got a challenge for you. The next, I have here three sounds. Which ones were generated by AI? OK. Who believes that this was generated by a computer or well, by a computer first, by a human, human one, uh, but I'm afraid to say that you lo lost. Uh, so this is Ava. Ava is 
uh, um, it's a startup that builds soundtracks using deep, deep uh, neural networks. And it basically trains, it has a, a, a DNN trained with lots of music, with Mozart, with Beethoven, and then it uses it to generate soundtracks in a very fast manner. Then they tweak it a bit in order to make it perfect. I'm not an expert in music, but for me, this was perfect. I could never tell that this was generated by a computer. Maybe an expert in music would. I don't know. Let's try pop. Well, a little bit better than the Eurovision, but not good enough, probably. This was also generated by a computer. Uh, but as you can see, it's not really that good, OK? Uh, and we have now the state of the art in speech. Quite awesome, in terms of quality. Um, if, we, if you look, if you remember the vocal, the first video that just passed, this is where we are right now. So how about images and text? Can we interpret them? Yes. We, this is an example of a paper that shows how I can generate images based on text. And for, to do that, I need to understand what's the text all about. This paper in particular, it not, use, not only uses the sentence in order to generate the images, but it gets features from the words themselves. So it uses f uh, things like bird, red, white, short beak, in order to use that to perfect the image. So in the first image that you see on the left, you have a very blurred image. But the last one is already quite, quite good and with a lot of high frequencies. So I think this is a major step that we're seeing now in the state of the art. And we also can apply this to writing. This is Harry Potter and the Cream Cake of Dumbledore. If you start reading it, it feels like Harry Potter. But when you read a couple of paragraphs, it doesn't make much sense. So there's something missing. So let's see what's under the hood. What's under the hood of systems like this? What's under the hood of systems like Alexa, Siri? And the first thing you, that you need to do is speech recognition. But in order to build a speech recognition model, you need, a lot, you need an acoustic model, you need a phonetic model, you need a language model. And to build all that, you need data. So when you, when you wonder that systems like this don't have your language available or doesn't, don't recognize you, it's because they were not trained with that data. And moving to a new language is a very high cost. For, the, for a company, even for companies like Apple, Amazon. It's, it's a tremendous high cost. And then you need to process the text that comes out of speech recognition. And to do that, you use tokenizers. You use NLP models. You try to recognize the intent. What are the named entities in each sentence? When I say, I want to go to the cinema to buy a ticket at 9 p.m., I need to teach the machine that uh, 9 p.m. is the time that uh, and when I want to go, it, that my intention is to go to the cinema. So it needs to reply to me, hey, where do you want to purchase the tickets? And you need to have context. And that's why you need the dialogue manager as well. I want to have a conversation. I don't want to have to repeat myself all over again each time it makes me a new question. So, and then we need to generate the response. And generate the response is, do, is doing the inverse. So getting text into speech again. What are the pain points, and why is this quite relevant? Well, how do you get the data? How do you get the data to build these systems? And one option is to rely on humans. OK, let's ask humans to give us this data, right? But many times, humans don't give what we need to train the models. We need appropriate data formatted in the, in, like the way we want to train the model. And we need to annotate it. And this takes a long time. And if you want a new language, we need data from that language or from that dialect. So this is really hard to scale, these systems. And what Define Crowd does is to provide these systems or help build these systems with a human in the loop. So we combine machine learning with crowdsourcing. Okay? But that has a challenge. We're dealing with people. 
Okay? We're putting people in the loop. If Alexa doesn't recognize what you're saying, we get a human to annotate that data and to return the annotated data in order for you to retain the models. And this works well. This is, you can integrate with our API, and it's amazing, but you have a human in the loop. So what happens if that human has bad intentions and doesn't do what he's supposed to? What if you're asked to, to transcribe the audio into text and he doesn't do it correctly, even if he has good intentions? So these are the type of measures that you see in the state of the art, which is, okay, let's have more people annotating the data. Let's have two, three people. What if all these people have bad intentions? How do you distinguish between good intentions and bad intentions, high quality and low quality? And that's where the machine learning comes. You can also design goal tasks, so tasks to which you know the answer to. But in many, many situations, this is not easy to do. And it takes a long time. And looking at the behavior of someone, it's also quite important. But if you put a rule in terms of for the behavior, well, it's very easy for thresholds to fail. So having a machine learning model behind all this works much better. But if you're annotating an image, it's completely different if you're transcribing an audio or if you're writing text. So machine learning can help these people be better can help detect people with bad intentions. And that's our platform. That's where the value of our platform is. But there are challenges, of course. When I ask you to do things like, OK, how would you address Alexa? And if I ask, for example, this gentleman over there, he would probably ask Alexa for a coffee. Hey, Alexa, can you bring me a coffee, please? But if I ask this lady over there, she would probably say, Hey, Alexa, I need a coffee right now. Please bring me one. Because John is talking and I'm almost. <laughs> um, so these different ways of people approaching the system is also what we want to collect. If we tell the machine the different manners of people interacting with the system, so if we teach the system those sort of things, then when the user comes, it will be much more natural. It will look natural. OK? And we won't have the problem that we see in ELISA in the first place, which is, OK, I have a set of rules. I'm using ELISA. When I do the TAN interaction, the same I get the same response, or it doesn't understand me, or uh, I don't recognize the intent. But we're asking people to do creative tasks. So how do I track quality in creative tasks? People are donating or are receiving a reward in exchange for their speech, for their text. How about ambiguous tasks like sentiment, right? Sentiment is subjective. Each one will have a different opinion. So if I want to build a sentiment analysis model, and I want annotated data in order to build my model using a supervised approach, probably people will have different opinions. How do I train irony, for example? How about, OK, you tell me, oh, let's put an expert annotating the data. Let's put, I'm doing a phonetic transcription, which is essential to build a speech recognition. Let's put an expert. It's more expensive, but the system will be great. But what happens when experts conflict with each other? They come many times, they come from different schools, they're annotating the data, and then their opinions don't match. How can we detect who is right? Who is right when you're annotating an image and someone says, this is a face. And another person comes, no, 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 no. And puts the annotation a little bit to the side. Who is right? Which one do you choose? Do you make an intersection? Do you make an union? Do you choose the one which has bet more expertise in these sort of tasks? Do you choose which one? So you need a rating. You need to know people. I want the, to finish my talk. I want, just want to show you our platform and what we do. So the platform, we have two sides of the platform. One, for the enterprise clients to come and request their, what they need. So in this case, the video will show you a speech data collection task, OK? So where people go, pick their phone, record a couple of sentences. And then we'll show you the um, crowd side, or what we call Nevo, OK? So here. In the first place, I'm going to select my project. I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to upload my data. So then I need to select the language. We work with 46 languages. 
I also need to select the age, the, the demographics about the people I want to give the speech. Probably I just want female speakers. Or I need to define my ontology. Each company has their own base of knowledge. So if I'm doing a name entity tagging task, I will use different ontologies across companies. An automotive company will have a different ontology from an energy company. And then I have access to analytics, the reports, it's completely transparent, okay? And all the quality metrics are exposed, so the client has access to everything. And this is the crowd side. This is what people do when they're doing, for example, a named entity task. So this is what they do when they're faced with text and they're training the system in order to tell uh, to teach the system, this is a name identity. This is what you need to recognize. And it comes in this context, okay? Because, for example, if I say the name Braga, it can be a proper name, but it can also be a city. So, and the models need to be smart enough in order to distinguish between all this, okay? So, I want to thank you for taking your time to listen, and I just wanted to also before I go, to show you a brief video of the state of the art, because we've been talking about what exist, existed before, a couple of examples of the state of the art, but I just wanted to show you a full example of interaction coming from Google. You probably already know it, but it's a really, really cool example. Thank you. So let's go back to this So thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say, if uh, you want to learn how to use our API and train a model end-to-end -end, uh, using our platform, we have a workshop tomorrow. Uh, and thank you once again. Thanks so much, Xiao. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. If anyone in the audience wants to ask Xiao a question. No? I have a question. So I work in the sales team at Landing Jobs, and this last video terrifies me. <laughs> es essentially, Joao, do you think I need to retrain in the next few years? Do you think Landing Jobs is going to find an AI to replace a complex process like sales in a business? Yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> no, I think, I think you're seeing um, AI, AI helping people in all sorts of jobs. Not, not replacing, but helping. And automating processes. Processes that were repetitive until then, we're seeing now AI. We see AI, for example, uh, doing uh, maintenance or uh, helping with maintenance in, in the energy sector. We see AI uh, in automotive, you see AI in retail. For example, in Amazon, you walk into a shop, you get in, you buy something, you go out, and somehow it, things get, get paid. So, in all that, behind all that, you have a lot of machine learning models in order to help make better decisions, in order to make predictions. Um, so, what we see now is uh, AI being applicable to not only uh, specific technological companies, but for example, HR companies. Can uh, you match a candidate with a job can, automatically? Can you look at a CV and see if it's interesting for a position? 
Um, and probably if you receive 1,000 CVs or 10,000 CVs, you can pick the one, automatically pick the ones that are most interesting. And a good example of this triage, is, and it's a much better example in the sense that it's health, it's for Watson. Watson, for example, helps doctors doing a triage of the best approaches to treat onco um, oncological diseases. Uh, so all that, what we see is uh, AI helping people, not exactly replacing them. You'll be, continue to be a great sales guy. <laughs> He's sweet. Yes, I'll come to you once. Uh, so, hi. Uh, thank you for the presentation, it was very interesting. Uh, I have a natural language processing question. Uh, so before we had something like Eliza, right, who does uh, based on a set of rules, it follows those rules and based on what you give it, based on your input, it gives you like a prepared output. So it would never, like it, it would pass kind of like a Turing test, like a fake Turing test because, okay, I can, I can make it look like it's a machine. But the thing is with machine learning that I want to ask you is this. Uh, I had some friends that were working on something, that were working on projects like this, when it seems to me that if you do just machine learning, you just get like raw data, and then you get no semantics, like you get no, uh, like it doesn't understand the language, he understands that there are these patterns throughout the data. And I was wondering if you think that the answer for natural language processing to get it into like things even more involved than the ones that you show right now, would be to get a hybrid system where you get semantics from linguistics and so on, and the data power of machine learning? Um, that, that's a hard question. When we speak about, I typically use the term natural language processing and not natural language understanding, because understanding is a very strong term. And you're right, what we do is to teach the machine about certain patterns. If this word comes out in this context, um, it will probably mean something, right? And the more data that we have, the better the model will work. Um, this is a very informal explanation, very rough explanation, but this is it. So I, I'm, I'm a believer of the semantic, the power of knowing the semantic value of something. There are some initiatives in that sense where you try to build a semantic network, a uh, base of knowledge, so let's say, what does this word mean? Um, what does this word mean in this language? And what are their synonyms? What, how do they relate with other words? And there are some efforts in terms of trying to map all that knowledge, which is what we have inside our brain, right? It's kind of uh, trying to replicate the knowledge and how uh, babies learn how to speak, learn, understand what is the meaning of things, or how we believe they learn, because we don't really know. We have an idea. Um, so I, I do believe that semantics is, is a great path. Uh, there are some people that don't really believe that. Um, and um, the tasks that we do here, uh, and the, the one that just shown here, is basically trying to catalog all these semantics, trying to gather all this knowledge. Um, but it's uh, doing this for all the knowledge in the world is, is a very complex task, and there, there are disagreements, right? People, sometimes you have a name identity. Uh, some people say, no, 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 this is something. And some other guy will say, no, 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 this is, belongs to a different category. People don't always agree. And name identity tagging, when you go to more specific fields, is very complex. Because you might have people that say that this entity is composed by two words, three words, and the other would just say, no, 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 the name identity tagging is just this word here in particular. So there's different opinions of how we can make this work. Uh, but short answer, yes, semantics is super important. <laughs> OK. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. So if you do have something that you just have to ask Joao, um, then you can speak to him on the Define Crowd stand, which is yes, uh, upstairs in the job. So I'm sure he'll be very happy to <laughs> answer any questions you have. So once again, big round of applause for Joao. Thank you.